I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Blimke. And you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. You can now listen to these podcasts and all of our old ones and see show notes at the newly designed FriendlyAtheistPodcast.com. Marshall Brain is best known as the founder of the website HowStuffWorks.com. In 2007, Discovery Communications bought the site for a whopping $250 million. He's appeared on Oprah, the National Geographic Channel, and CNN, and has written several books. His latest one may be the most controversial one yet. It's called How God Works. Marshall, thank you so much for the podcast. For joining us. <laughs> one of these days, guys. Leave it in, Chris. <laughs> How are you well, doing? Awesome to be here. It is uh, fantastic to talk to you. I'm a giant fan of your work. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so let's start with how stuff works. I mean, you started this website kind of as a hobby uh, years ago. I mean, this is kind of really early days of the modern internet as we know it. I mean, you just kind of put it out there, this information explaining how yeah. like a car engine works, and it just exploded in popularity. Uh, what was the... What was the idea that just said, you know what, I am interested in this stuff. Let me put it on the Internet. Where did that even come from? Why do that? I like writing, and I've written a, a number of books, and I got done with one book and wanted to not write another one at that moment. Because to write a book, you have to write the whole thing. Yeah. You know, like you have to it is one of the downsides of writing a book. Yes, you have to complete it. So I wanted to do something incremental, and so the internet was the the new thing, getting a ton of press. And so I thought, well, I'll just write about Stuff. these, you know, these articles about how things work because I was interested in it. I'm an engineer by training, and I had always been taking things apart. So I did start writing. The first one was how car engines work. And I put that out on the internet, and no one cared. And then, <laughs> but I enjoyed it, so I put out another one, and then no one cared. And it wasn't until there were about twenty of them that anybody cared. Mm -hmm. And then it just sort of started to become popular. And it just turns out there's millions of people who are interested in how things work. And so it just caught that vibe, and the internet, you know, was a new place, and a lot of people found it, and it. You know, it was right place at right time kind of thing. I remember the first, I think the first link I saw to that website was about how to pick locks. And it was fascinating. <laughs> what were you it, doing, Hammond? I know, I was looking up some stuff. Um, but it had animations and everything that kind of explained what's going on when you put a key inside of, like, the keyhole. Mm. Like, what's actually happening inside. And it was the coolest thing to see whenever I, what it was that I saw yeah, it. Yeah, I remember in 2007, I read how acoustic guitars work. And it was, I don't think it stuck because acoustics are certainly way over my head, but it was, it was cool. And it feels like something that like needed to exist, just like the yeah. kind of the And part. in layman terms in ways that anyone could understand, right. which was nice. That lock picking article from the day it went up has been super popular. And that was before. <laughs> That's got to be scary. <laughs> <laughs> that can't be good. <laughs> yeah. That was before, you know, YouTube existed when that article right. first went up. So the animations were really, you know, unique at that time in history. Now you can find a, a thousand YouTube videos on lockpicking, and, and they're probably better in a lot of cases because some of the YouTube stuff is fantastic. Well, that's an interesting point. So, like, you entered the, the Internet Marketplace in so many words, f because you wanted to put out this kind of information where the internet wasn't necessarily a place you could go to find anything in, you know, the mid-2000s. It was probably even pre-Google when you started some of this, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Um, Google saved how stuff works, actually. Huh. Um, and so it is, you know, it was a, it was a unique time in history. Sure. So, so now that, you know, it's 10, 15, 20 years later, now that Google and YouTube and all these things, WikiHow all exist, how do you think, why, because your website is still really successful, why do you think that is? How has it stayed, you know, have kept head and shoulders above the competition? Part of it uh, certainly has to do with the way search engines work. And so because it's been around a long time and because it went through this period of intense popularity, there are a zillion links into it. Mm. 
and that is is like a legacy that it will have forever, essentially. But now you look at Wikipedia, and Wikipedia has far more content and far more links into it. So usually Wikipedia now supersedes any any search results for how stuff works, as it probably should be. So it is possible, you know, even with that legacy for uh, a site to come and, and supersede how stuff works, and that happens fairly regularly now. But you know, before Wikipedia existed, How Stuff Works was the number one result for a, a whole bunch of articles, mm-hmm. like thousands and thousands of topics. So how much now, um, it, it, the kind of How Stuff work, Works empire, I guess for lack of a better word, has grown so far beyond just the website. There's this, the podcasts, uh, Stuff You Should Know, Stuff You Missed in History Class, Stuff Mom, ne- never, wait, stuff Mom Didn't Tell You, Stuff Mom Never Told You. One of those. Right. Um, how close are you to, like, do you have your hands on those things, or do you just kind of, like, let them grow into their own thing? I am completely disconnected from how stuff works at this point. Oh, I'm I didn't know off, that. Yeah, I'm off doing other things. But, you know, it's it's just something I created, and there are thousand pieces of content in there that, that I worked on, and it's a topic space I love. Mm-hmm. So, um you know, all there's all these things that got attached to it. There's T V show, the podcast like yeah. you mentioned, there was a magazine, there are a series of books. Um we did a whole bunch of radio and news uh snippets and you know a myriad other things. And it's just funny how a brand like that can can expand. Just like it's sort of like Under Armour. You know, they started with with t-shirts, uh-huh. you know, essentially a special kind of t-shirts. And now I was at the dentist yesterday and you can buy an Under Armour mouth guard for $350, <laughs> right. right? And like, where did that come from? Right. So $350 is a lot for a mouth guard. Right. And, and uh, if part of this is if, something uh, Jessica alluded to in the intro, which is that, you know, this site we said was sold for like $250 million, but that's the end of a long chain of ownership, I guess, because someone bought the site for a smaller amount and then it gets taken over, it gets bigger, and that process happens, you know, it iterates itself many, many times over. So uh, are you just are you just a spectator at this point of that particular empire that you created? Uh, repeat the word. Am I a what? Are you a spectator? Are you just kind of visiting the site now? And, like, are your hands completely off of it so you can work on other projects? Yes, I'm I'm totally detached and uh, on to better things. Got it. No, not necessarily better, just different things. Different things. You do something for, you know, I did it for 12 years, mm-hmm. and that's enough. Sure. You know, it's like it's time to do something else. So let's talk about those other projects. Your latest book is called How God Works. Um, I love that title. And how did you, like, what was your motivation behind um, writing a book like that? So this goes back a long way. Um, so I have the website, why won't God heal amputees.com. Right. I don't know Another if people realize <laughs> that. I, I've heard of that site for a long time. I don't know if they, that people realize that you're, that's your creation as well. Right, and that whole question, that question didn't exist in the thought space until that website went up. And that's really a book that I published online so that it could reach a bigger audience. Like, just especially at that point in history, if you wanted to hit a large audience, that was the way to do it, to make a free website and let the search engines pick it up and get a lot of people talking about that topic. And if you go into Google now and type in something like God and amputees, there are hundreds of thousands of pages dealing with that topic, which is which is fascinating and cool. So then the site uh, godisimaginary.com spun out of that. So it's a repackaging of the same kind of content but into more bite-sized nuggets that are much easier to link to. So there's 50 proofs in 
the website godisimaginary.com and you can just go and you know pick and choose or you can read them sequentially or you can link to the one that's really um apropos to the discussion you're having you know so they're they're kind of parallel sites but just structured differently for a different kind of audience and then there's a video channel that I created and then I rested for a while. Again, I got, you know, I did it for a couple of years and it was fun and then I rested. But then a publisher came along a couple of years ago and said, you know, this really ought to be a book. <laughs> and so that's where How God Works came from. And that means you have to write the whole thing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it takes years and it's like, and you have, I have had a fantastic editor help me with it. And then, you know, all the production stuff and it has to get printed on paper and, um, you know, it's a <laughs> much different that. process. <laughs> are you are you worried at all that putting your name behind? I mean, when you have how does God heal or why won't God heal amputees? You are kind of uh, on. You are kind of in the background there. The website and the site's name takes front and center. Are you worried that having your name on a book called How uh, Does God Work? How God Works. I'm sorry. Are you worried that having your name on that book might ruin your reputation in any way? Because now you're questioning something that is controversial as opposed to car engines. Yeah, well, this is the whole coming out of the closet problem, right? Are you going to talk about your your position or not? And you have a great video on this, actually, um, that I think is really interesting and powerful and important and it you know if you go to a place like reddit and go to their atheism subreddit there's you know what if you're a teenager and you want to come out of the closet on this topic it like that can actually be far more dangerous than what i'm doing at least right. you know I'm, you're established right i i have some kind of position i can speak from but, you know, if you're a teenager and you say this to your parents and they, you know, violently disagree with you, there are lots of documented situations where you're just in a bad spot at that point. So compared to that, I think, you, you know, there will be, I hope, discussion about it. And there will be some people who really intensely dislike this whole topic and, yeah, like, that's just part of the part of the game, but most of that has been worked out through the process of publishing. Why won't God heal amputees? And God is imaginary. I think most of that is now uh, in the past. We'll see. So, what don't we know about how God works? <laughs> what don't we know? I guess um, what do we know would be a better way yeah. to start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, well. So here's the deal with the book is, first of all, one goal of it is to show people a way to demonstrate to themselves that God is imaginary. So I, I just take it as a given that, you know, like a, a, a theist would say, God is real, and God wrote the Bible, and God answers prayers, and that's their position. My position is God is imaginary, and let me show you, you know, a, a hundred reasons why, but also let me show you the mental framework that will demonstrate this to you. You don't need, you know, me to, to prove it to yourself. You can prove it to yourself with a, a set of techniques and ideas. So that's the first part, is just showing people how to, sh how to demonstrate that God is imaginary. But then the second part that inevitably comes up is, well, can you prove that anything is imaginary? There's a lot of people who will contest that. Mm -hmm. So we have to get over that hurdle, too. Like, how do we, how do we show that anything is imaginary? And uh, it turns out people do that all the time, and it's a big part of uh, the medical establishment, and once you understand how clinical trials and double-blind testing prove whether medical effects are real or imaginary, you can then apply that over to God, and, and it works exactly the same way. And then the third thing is, okay, God is imaginary, but we have, like, two billion Christians 
who believe otherwise. And we have just about as many Muslims, and we have about a billion Hindus. So we have at least five billion theists who believe that God is real, even though he is clearly imaginary. And why would that happen? And to me, that's the most interesting thing. Like, religion is just fascinating to me. Yeah. And the, this whole notion that you could have five billion people believing that something imaginary is real, and why would that happen, and how would that happen, and how do you help them get over that? That's a big part of the book as well. So you're clearly aiming the book. I mean, it's not aimed at atheists. You're aiming for the people who are on the fence or religious right now. I'm just wondering if your publishers have any uh, method of marketing to that community. How do you get them to read this book? I think one way is to build up a lot of buzz around it. Um, you know, another way is pure curiosity. Uh, the third way is there's a big spectrum of, of religious belief, everything from evangelical fundamentalists at one end of the spectrum, all the way down to people who are just, you know, very casually Christian. You could say to them, are you a Christian? And they would answer yes, but they don't go to church, they don't pray, they don't read the Bible, they, you know, they don't do any of the things we would associate with Christians. They're just... They're rhinos. They're religious <laughs> in name only. <laughs> I've never heard that before this I just second. made it up. Did you really? Oh my God, patent pending, patent pending. <laughs> it is... It is true, they, and and it's because it's much easier to move through our society with a yes answer than a no answer. Like it just is, and it's. I live in the southern United States, and to to mention that you have a no answer to the "Are you Christian?" question immediately in many many contexts creates problems. So the yes answer just is social lubricant that helps you make your way through the society as it is now. Well, I think that's particularly true in the South um, and in an older generation. You know, I'm in, I'm in my 20s. I live in Chicago. For me, saying that I'm an atheist, I mean, maybe there's unforeseen con- you know, consequences that I haven't seen. But like in my workplace, I can tell people what my podcast is or what my blog is. And there no one isn't, cares. Yeah, <laughs> nobody cares. But I work with, like, 22-year-olds. They, right. I don't know. Can be very different in the South. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. a different world. <laughs> so when How Stuff Works was getting really popular, I think one of the things that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that really made it explode is that you were on the Oprah Winfrey show and because she really enjoyed the site. And I think you were on there a couple of times. I take it Oprah's not bringing you back on her network to talk about <laughs> this book. <laughs> Let us not, let us not uh, put that off the table. <laughs> the book, it's not designed to be confrontational. No, it's, it's really not. I've had be... a chance to look at it. It is very much a, uh, I just want to explain this to you. I'm not trying to say you're an idiot. Right. Exactly. It's, it's informational or educational. It is, and, and here, let me show you why you might believe in God, even though he is imaginary. Like, what is going on inside your head that causes you to believe in this imaginary thing? And what, you know, are the social forces at work and things like that? So, it, you know, there's a good chance I could be on the, the Oprah Winfrey show talking about this topic, and that would be healthy for our society. I agree, it would be. I happen. I hope your optimism prevails. Yeah. <laughs> now, but here's the thing. Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, you could make the case that with their, uh, with with Letter to a Christian Nation, with the end of faith, with the God delusion, they were trying to do the same thing. They were trying to explain to people why they should shed their faith. But, I mean, I would think most theists see them as very antagonistic, as as angry atheists. What are you doing differently from them? that will make your book more palatable to people who are religious? I think the first thing is that, you know, the classic four, um, Harris and Dawkins and Dennett and... Uh, and Hitchens. Hitchens, right. They're all Ph.D. level in 
incredibly smart, uh, eloquent people, but often over the heads of uh, <laughs> I'll just set myself up. I'm the common man here. Mm-hmm. I do not have a PhD, but I am very good at explaining how things work. Mm-hmm. And I have a huge track record doing it. So what I've done is tried to take these concepts down to a level that all of us can understand and discuss and relate to easily. So that's one differentiator. The other differentiator is I'm not coming at this antagonistically. Like I am not, you know, there's, there's definitely a flavor, especially in Dawkins material of, you know, religion is, is evil. And, uh, you know, I don't know that that's necessarily the central theme, but it's certainly a side theme that keeps coming up. And I don't, you know, that really is not an issue for me. I don't, know that I want to go back in the history of religion and rehash, you know, things that have happened in the past. And I know that really can cause, you know, ISIS is a great example of religion having a, yeah. a negative effect. But that's not really what I'm here to discuss. I'm here to discuss the fact that we can show that God is imaginary. And now let's understand why so many people are believing in this imaginary thing. And and can we mature as a society past that? Which I think we can, if we can start discussing it openly. Let me, let me shift gears for a second. And I'm curious about this as, from more of a business perspective, um, you know, you took this site that was a hobby. It became kind of a for-profit company, even when you were involved in it with a lot of employees. Um, and I wonder what you've learned about running a business like that, about how the internet works from when you became uh, really big with that site to where you are now. What have, what has changed? What have you learned from that experience? Hemant is asking how we can sell this podcast for $250 million. That is exactly what so I'm asking. If you could point us in that direction. Discovery, right, call so us. Let's first, <laughs> let's first understand that there was a a large amount of luck at play there. And let's also understand that um, that how stuff works had hundreds of talented people, some genius level people working with the company who it far eclipsed anything I contributed to the site. So I did create it. I did set the tone for it. I did do all the initial content and won the initial awards and stuff. But the people who did the business side of it, are like, several of them were geniuses. And the sale, the Discovery Channel, there's a, a great example of luck. If that sale had happened four months later, it would have been in the middle of the – you know, the massive financial downturn in 2008. Mm. And it just happened to close and be done before all that started. But, you know, and that's, that's just pure luck. There's no other way to say it. So you have the ability to hire and work with and be with these genius level people. You have timing. You have the fact that it got started at exactly you know, a great time. Yeah, the fact that Google came along and treated it the way it did. Um, you know, all those factors were in there. But having said that, if you go look at godisimaginary.com, that is the simplest website in the world. But it's got really good position in Google. It's got great traffic. Uh, it has uh, persisted. And, and held up uh, content-wise over a long period of time. So if you wanted to, you know, if, if you wanted to think about your site and your presence and so on, um, you know, that you would want to look at first, what can I do to get more traffic, obviously, right? But there's, there's, 50 ways to, tr- to work on something to create more traffic. And then how can I get some genius level people working with and helping me on this site? Like how do I build a 
that team or get these people involved in some way, then um, how do I expand my content? You know, and we could go through we could go through two dozen things, and we should probably do it offline sometime. <laughs> it, it, Done. It would be a fun and fascinating conversation. So. How did you find your background. genius team? How did you find those people that really took the site to another level later on? I, I mean, primarily, the short answer to that is networking. Is you form a a big social group of people who are kind of aligned with you and interested in what you're doing, and then you ask them for help in their areas of expertise. And if you need, you know, if you, you, you declare a problem, and then you go into your network and you say, okay, who's the best guy in the world to solve problem X? And, and there is a best guy in the world, or, or there's five of them, or whatever. And then you go figure out how you can talk to that person and solve that problem. That is a way to approach it. And let me just say, what I do in the afterlife from being in How Stuff Works is I <laughs> teach entrepreneurship at NC State. Oh, nice. So, you know, I, so I'm a college professor, and this is the kind of stuff we talk about every day in class, is how do you, you know, how do you get problems solved? How do you get exposure? How do you... Um, get people interested in what you're doing. And also understand that some things work and some things just don't. You know, there's no, there's this luck element in it that cannot be denied. So you have to work with that as well. Well, good thing Hemant already found his genius. I'm sitting right here, <laughs> Hemant. Found your genius. We'll, just, we'll <laughs> schedule a call and we'll talk through. I, I think that would be fascinating and just that would talk be fun. through what is it you're trying to accomplish and and then where are you now and then where do you want to be and then how do you get there what sort of conversations do you have i mean what sort of questions do your college students ask you regarding this stuff i mean do they understand are they trying to do what you did or are they trying to do some things that are so different regarding entrepreneurship from the stuff you did well, in, in the class I teach, we don't do any websites or apps. We do physical products because these are engineers. NC State is a kind of a premier engineering school in the United States. So we're doing uh, entrepreneurial ideas with engineers, and therefore they're physical products so that they can use engineering principles. But this whole idea of getting your thing discovered. Like, how do you do that? How do you make people aware? And we have some great examples of that working. So there's this, you know, a student in my class who did a Kickstarter campaign and raised $270,000. Oh, jeez. We have, did, have you heard of Undercover Colors? No, I haven't. No. This is fingernail polish that lets, a woman detected oh, date yeah. rape the... drugs have been put in her. Drink. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, the date rape. The thing. Date that rape. Yeah. The, yeah, that came out of the program. Got an unbelievable amount of press. Yeah, yeah. not all and of it that, good, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, it got all kinds of press. Yeah, yeah. Like, just like this book is going to get. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to get some positive press. It's going to get some negative press. It's going to get some. You're going straight to hell, and right and. You're a blasphemer. I mean, you can get, uh, you know, amazing amounts of press from all sides. But in their case, all that press was good, and a, there was an element of luck and timing in that as well. But that particular product that came out of the class exploded because uh, it was in the right place at the right time, and it's a great idea. Yeah, I remember uh, reading about it. It was good press initially because the idea was, you know, girls could have this fingernail, po uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, they have their fingernail polish, they could dip it in a drink, and yeah, they could find out right then and there if someone slipped something in their drink. But then the reaction later on was that, how dare we put that 
on women the to figure out women. why why is the onus on women to do that? And that was obviously an unintentional. Like it seemed like they didn't see that coming. That that yeah, uh, it's a good idea. It's the criticism. Like, there's flaws to be had, like the fact right. that like the percentage of. But initially, Rates anyway, it are, did get that. Yeah. Uh, you could understand why people would want to, I guess, fundraise for that sort of thing. I could see why people would want that initiative. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Kickstarter and doing it through that channel is just a, that's a way you never had access to either. Oh, it's unbelievable and and utterly fantastic. It's like free money just falling from the sky. <laughs> And I, what could be better than that? Right. I wonder if you've had the same experience where I, I've gotten this question a few times. They're like, I want to write about religion or I want to write about whatever. Um, and I want to have a popular blog. How do I make that happen? I'm like, but and luck plays a part of it. And part of it was like, well, I did it for like a couple of years and not that many people were paying attention. Right. And but you keep building on that. And eventually it kind of just builds. And you were saying you wrote how many of these uh, how stuff works articles before the popularity really kicked in. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of groundwork you got to set before any of the success comes, but and then it's being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I think there's a sense of like I want to do something and I want it to be successful this right month off or the bat. yeah, and right. it's that's not the reality of most successful right. things. Yeah, there are a few things that that do explode right from the start. One of my favorite examples is. Uh, Mr. Bieber, whether you like him or not, <laughs> you know, if you look at his creation story, that is unbelievable how he got started. It was like a spark touched him and he exploded with a nuclear blast. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> un- it's like Napster. I don't know if you remember Napster. I love yeah. when Napster. It, when <laughs> Senior year of high school, out. man. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It exploded absolutely from the moment of its birth. And so that does happen, but that is so rare. Yeah, the fact that we can name those off the top of our heads means there's not that many of them. (laughs) Those have to be interesting case studies in class. Let's Today we'll discuss Bieber (laughs) tomorrow. (laughs) Um, Do your kids ever come up to you now and ask how stuff works, or are you just like, Dad, shut up. I'll figure this out on my own. (laughs) Well, so here's an interesting thing. The the kids and I talk all the time about how stuff works and how business works. And, um, you know, like tonight, I have a can of soda in my car called Mati Energy Drink that was created by a student at Duke. Okay. And she's having phenomenal success right now. She Like, she created her own brand of soda and is, and is distributing it. And, you know, and her market is growing and stuff. And... You know, they ask, like, where did this can come from and why, you know, how did it get started? And, like, the whole, its whole creation story is fascinating. That one little product, but it's having great success right now. So we talk about that kind of stuff all the time. But I have not ever talked about uh, religion with my kids Hmm. because, you know, well, for a lot of reasons, but that is just an interesting thing about our society. I'm not going to... I'm going to let them go out into the world and experience it and come to their own conclusions. And there will come a point where, you know, we as as adults can intelligently talk about religion, but I don't see any need to impose what I'm thinking and writing about on on them, I'm letting them go out and experience the world as they experience it and come to their own conclusion. How old's the oldest kid? Uh, 16, 14, 12, and 12. Okay. I think that's such an interesting dichotomy. We've talked to, you know, on this podcast and just kind of in life, we've talked to a lot of religious people and we've talked to a lot of non religious people, many of whom who had kid, many of whom had, had kids. And I feel like most of the non believers, atheists, uh, humanists, say have a response similar to that like you know my kids maybe know what i believe but i'm gonna let them make their own decision because i feel like most of the religious people we talk to are like no they need to get this you know this is what they need to believe and we're gonna homeschool them yeah we're gonna protect them from from hearing opposite opinions and i think that's such i don't know maybe a good example of like the difference between the two cultures maybe that's a good point um and i think if you don't have anything invested in it, 
like I don't. Uh, people will will say you've written two giant websites and a book now on this. How can you say you don't have anything invested <laughs> in it? But I I don't care what you believe, right? You know, necessarily, it, it's this is not what I what I go around thinking about every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I work with hundreds of people of all different faiths, and that's great. Like, everybody can believe what they want. Um, I just don't talk about it in in public. It's it's a non-thing. Like politics, I don't talk about that in public either because that, that has become toxic right. in a lot of cases. Like, crazy where we're at politically right now. Yeah. And there's a fascinating link between politics and religion that gets discussed in the book. It is, it is really interesting. I mean, we all know it, you know, like, you don't talk about religion and politics. That's a, a common, well-known thing. Like, why? Like, what? And there's there's a lot of things that are linked up between both of them. Is it something you're going to start talking about now regarding religion anyway, because you're coming out with the book now? Is that something you're going to bring up with people you work with? Or if maybe they'll, they'll start asking you questions about it. Yeah. Right. If someone brings it up with me, I'm happy to talk about it. And I'm happy to do that in a... I, in a, in like a casual, friendly way, let's just talk about it like we would talk about, you know, bass fishing or, you know, <laughs> let's just have a conversation about it. There is no reason for it to escalate to this giant emotional thing. Um, but I will not, like just walking around in the real world, I don't ever bring it or politics up because it just isn't a productive use of time. How will you know if your book is successful? Well, you know, I knew Why Won't God Heal Amputees was successful when I got a letter from Sam Harris asking if he could mention it in letters <laughs> to a Christian name. What? Then I knew that somehow <laughs> it had made it to a certain point. Um, you know, if if How God Works were to, to rank decently on Amazon.com, that would be a sign of success. But... You know, I think if it if it breaks outside of the of the you know of our community, the the community we're you and and me and uh, the folks who are in the audience, if it gets outside our community into the the larger society and starts to be discussed in a helpful, rational way. I think that would be really healthy, and I think that would be a sign of success. Well, that's great. Um, Marshall, when does the book come out? January 6th. Yeah. And if anyone's, if anyone's interested, there will be an excerpt from the book. We'll link to it in the notes for the show. Uh, when you're listening to this podcast, we'll post an excerpt from the book. So, Marshall, thank you for joining us, and good luck with the new book. Thank you so much for the great questions, and... I will just say again, I'm a giant fan of, of your work. The, the whole idea of a friendly atheist is fantastic. <laughs> Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Thank you, Marshall. Thanks for listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. This episode was taped at Cinnamon Sound Studios in Aurora, Illinois. The music was composed by Brad Chagdis. If you like what you're hearing, please consider making a contribution at Patreon.com slash Hemant. That's he T. We appreciate your support. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us at FriendlyAtheistPodcast at gmail.com. I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Blumke. We hope you'll join us next time.